Hello, my name is Ron Broussard. Today we'll be talking about Chapter 19, Seizures and Snigapy. So when dealing with seizures, what we'll be talking about is a seizure being an electrical firestorm that's occurring in the brain. In a sense, you have these uncontrolled electrical discharges that's going on, leading to an alteration in mental activity, okay, including complete loss of consciousness, up to you know, muscle contractions, rigidity, maybe even behavioral changes. Now, epilepsy is a condition in and of itself that is the cause of seizures. Now, seizures can be secondary, meaning they could be another medical condition such as fever, hypo or hyperglycemia, trauma, uh, that causes a seizure to occur. Now, with the pathophysiology of seizures, we have primary seizures, which are considered to be unprovoked. Now, these generally are genetic in nature or have an unknown cause. Now, with your primary seizures, that's where we're going to have uh, epilepsy uh, covering those. So, if somebody has recurrent seizures uh, where there is no secondary cause to it, they may be diagnosed with epilepsy. Now, generalized seizures involve both hemispheres of the brain. Now, if you recall back to pathophysiology uh, and the reticular activating system and uh, what we need in order to be conscious, uh, you need the reticular activating system to function and at least one cerebral hemisphere. So with a generalized seizure, we're having the effect on both hemispheres of the brain. Therefore, we have a loss of consciousness. Now, we also have partial seizures, which only involve one hemisphere of the brain, and we have simple partial seizures, and then we have complex partial seizures, and we'll get into these a little bit more. Now, secondary seizures are going to be caused from something else, okay? So there is an underlying cause to it, whether it be a trauma, like uh, a skateboarder who falls off a skateboard, hits his head, and then starts to convulse. Or be a fever. You have a, you know, a two-year-old that has like 105, 106 fever, and all of a sudden starts seizing. There is a cause to that seizure. Now, with treating those, uh, a lot of times we go to treat the cause of the seizure. Now, these seizures, secondary seizures, uh, are more than likely going to be a generalized type seizure. Now, status epilepticus. Now, what this is, is this is a seizure that is lasting for longer than 30 minutes where we have high risk for there to be brain cell damage, okay? Now, there's also a couple of other definitions that we can include in status epilepticus. So, if you have a patient that's been seizing for 30 minutes, that's the big one, all right? But if you have repeated seizure activity where there is no recovery in between. So let's say a patient has a seizure and they're you know, convulsing and then they stop convulsing, but they never regain consciousness and then they go right back into another seizure uh, and that repeats itself. Even though the seizure may have stopped, there was never a recovery uh, in between that seizure activity. We can include that in the status of epilepticus as well. Now, this is a life-threatening emergency. Uh, unfortunately, as EMTs, we have to just focus our care on, at a basic level, you know, maintaining our ABCs, protecting the patient, uh, but we're really gonna need that higher level of care uh, in order to stop that seizure activity, okay? Airway compromise, hypoxia is, is gonna be a big life-threatening issue in status epilepticus because if a patient's having full-blown muscle contractions, diaphragm is a muscle too. So odds are they're probably not going to be breathing effectively during that seizure. Now, types of seizures. So types of seizures, we have generalized seizures. Now remember generalized, we are talking about it affecting both hemispheres of the brain. Therefore, the patient is not awake or aware. Now these are considered our tonic clonic type seizures or grand mal type seizures where the patient's going to have this period of uh, muscle rigidity uh, followed by contractions. Okay, so remember generalized patients not awake, not aware, affects both hemispheres of the brain. Okay, and these are going to be more your tonic clonic or grand mal type seizures. Now,
with your generalized tonic-clonic seizures. We have different stages. So the aura is going to be what precedes that seizure activity. Uh, and it could be different for different people. You can have somebody who, you know, these patients, they might even know that they're going to have a seizure because of that aura. You can have somebody who maybe has the taste of like pennies in their mouth. I've had somebody describe it to me. Or they see spots or they have like an unusual odor that they smell uh, and they know a seizure is, is coming. They can predict it based on this aura. It's something that happens prior to the seizure, kind of lets them know that the seizure is coming. And then you have loss of consciousness. Okay, so uh, the patient will lose consciousness and then they'll go into the uh, tonic phase where they have muscle rigidity, they get stiff. Uh, hypertonic phase where you might see like arching in the back. And then the clonic phase where you have like the actual convulsions or the spastic movement of the patient. Okay, all of this will be ended in the postictal state. The postictal state is going to be that state of recovery. All right, your patient's going to be extremely exhausted. Uh, going to, the best time to treat them is going to be in the postictal state uh, because they're not going to be clenched. They're not going to be like jerking around. Uh, but understand that because of all that activity, they're going to be really tired. Okay, and that is the best time to coach treat them and to do interventions is in that postictal state. I'm not saying you know if they're you're just going to wait for them to stop seizing before you do anything, but uh, it is going to be a lot easier for you to treat them uh, in that postictal phase. All right, so generalized tonic-clonic seizure, grand mal seizure. You have this aura followed by loss of consciousness. Okay, we get into the uh, tonic or hypertonic phase, uh, and then we go into the clonic phase where they have the muscle contractions, and then postictal where they're going to be recovering from that seizure. Now, emergency medical care. Now, if the seizure has stopped, provide reassurance and conduct an assessment. Okay. Now, with this, you can have a patient that has had these seizures in the past. They are 100% aware of them, uh, and they are not going to want to go to the hospital, all right? Understand if the patient is alert and oriented, they are competent to refuse care, and they have, you know, recovered from the seizure, you know, they have every right to do so. Uh, you may have local protocols, though, that might require you to contact medical direction, contact base hospital before, like, a, for sure, having a patient refusal sign, go AMA. Uh, just make sure you're following local protocols with that. Understand if the patient is not competent, if the patient is not oriented, uh, they should not be signing out AMA after a seizure. And if it is a seizure that has occurred for the first time, you should always exhaust all efforts to talk to them and to try to get them to go to the hospital to be evaluated. All right, so different generalized type seizures, okay? So we have absent seizures. Uh, absent seizures are, you can look at them as like a, a person's daydream. All right, so you have somebody who's out there daydreaming. Um, a lot of times a patient may have an absent seizure and somebody just mistake it as like, oh, well, they're not, you know, they're just not paying attention. They're just daydreaming right now. Uh, and that'd be overlooked and be missed, all right? You have uh, myoclonic seizures. Myoclonic seizures are where you have like jerking motion, okay, or the convulsions. Tonic seizures where the patient gets completely rigid. You have atonic seizures. Now atonic just without, you know, muscle rigidity, so they become limp. Okay, and then you have febrile seizures. Now febrile seizures uh, are going to present like, you know, your classic generalized grand mal type seizure, uh, but it's brought on by a fever. Okay, so febrile brought on by a fever. All right, now we have our partial seizures. Partial seizures, simple partial seizures involve abnormal movements uh, of one area of the body. Now, the patient's awake and aware, all right, so they understand what's going on, uh, because it's only affecting one cerebral hemisphere, but like they may have a jerking motion in an arm, okay, in a leg. Understand now that that seizure 
can start as a simple partial seizure where it's just an arm that's you know maybe rigid or convulsing and it could spread to a generalized seizure where that patient loses consciousness and then goes into like a grand mal type seizure all right now <clears throat> We have some different types of simple partial seizures. We have motor seizures. That's where the patient's going to have, you know, that issue with movement. So jerking, rigidity, sensory seizures, where the patient's going to lose like sensation. All right. Autonomic seizures. That's going to be more specific to the patient's autonomic nervous system, like issues with heart rate, blood pressure, respirations. And now psychic seizures. That's going to be more uh, of a psychological thing where the patient's having uh, behavioral issues, patients may be having like, depression from the seizure activity, even like experience of deja vu, it's kind of interesting. Understand though, that with these simple partial seizures, the patient is awake and aware of what's going on. Okay, now emergency medical care, if reoccurring in less than five minutes, no medical care is needed, okay? so. Pretty much what we're saying is if this is something that they deal with if they're being treated by a doctor and it's not something that's happening for an extended amount of time there may not be anything that you need to do because these patients may refuse to go to the hospitals like they're already being treated they don't want to go get evaluated they don't have like the full workup done they know what's going on now understand that these simple seizures though can progress into generalized seizures so it's not you know something that you just want to dismiss as nothing. You want to make sure you get a good set of vital signs on the patient, get a good history, get a good mental status, because these patients can progress into generalized seizures. Now, complex partial seizures, uh, the patient, it's affecting one hemisphere of the brain, so the patient stays awake. However, they are not aware of what is going on around them. Okay, uh, a lot of times these get mistaken as, uh, you know, like a behavioral type patient where it's a behavioral emergency and because they just think that person's acting crazy. They may think that that person's intoxicated or under the influence of drugs based on the seizure activity. Now, it starts with a blank stare followed by random movements. That could be the patient, you know, kind of bouncing their hands on their hips. All right, that could be the patient flapping their arms, flapping their hands. That could be the patient doing like a, like almost like they're rolling a marble in between their fingers, pulling at their clothes, smacking their lips, uh, whatever it might be for that person. But it's just random, random movements. Okay, they could repeat words or phrases. Okay, they do not respond to commands because they're not aware. They're awake, so you may be talking to them. You may be, sir, sir, sir. And they're not responding back. We'll understand they're not aware due to the seizure activity. Okay. Now, emergency care is going to be supportive. Okay. So you're going to allow it to, to run its course. Okay. And we're going to focus on treating that patient in the postictal state. You can't get upset. You can't get frustrated. And it may be difficult for you because it's like, well, this person's not even paying attention to me. Uh, just do as much of your assessment without touching the patient as possible. You can see, you can observe airway, you can observe breathing on that patient, and then wait for them to come out of this seizure. Because again, for the most part, these don't last very long. So the patient should come out of this. Now, if they don't, that's when it gets more into that life-threatening condition. So when the patient does come out of the seizure, that's when you're going to start to assess them because that's when they're going to start to be become aware of what's going on. Now, secondary generalized seizures does involve the entire body, typical phases of a generalized tonic clonic seizure. Now, this is where they have moved from this simple or complex partial seizure into a generalized seizure. So we go from affecting only one hemisphere, but that seizure has crossed hemispheres and now is affecting both sides of the brain. So understand with that, both hemispheres of the brain are affected, so we have a loss of consciousness. All right, so click on the description that best characterizes a simple partial seizure. So A, jerky motion or jerky muscle movements localized to one extremity, I like that one. 
Uh, B, full body rhythmic muscle contractions and relaxation. All right, probably not going to be full body there. That's where we're getting more grand mal or general, uh, generalized type seizures. Staring in a space with brief loss of awareness accompanied by rapid eye blinking. Okay, D, awake with loss of awareness and bizarre behavioral uh, behaviors such as repetitive movements. All right, so C and D we got to throw out. We got to throw that out because we have a loss of awareness. With that loss of awareness, now we know we're not in a simple partial seizure anymore. We're in a complex partial seizure. Okay, B. Uh, all right, well, you may think it's like, hey, well, they're not talking anything about the patient being alert, being aware. Uh, the thing is here is like full body rhythmic muscle contractions. That's where we're looking at like that myo, the myoclonic. So you have... Uh, tonicity and you have clonicity, so where you have muscle rigidity and muscle relaxation. Uh, at that point, you have to look at that more as a, a generalized type seizure. Now, with A, jerky muscle movements localized to one extremity, that is more in line with a simple partial seizure. All right, so assessment based approach. So, scene size. So, as we're coming up on this scene, okay, look and see what's going on. Now, remember, not all seizures do. Is it a patient with epilepsy? And patients can experience a seizure due to outside stimuli, okay, whether it be, you know, here we go, poison, medical condition, trauma. Like head trauma is a, a big one. So we really need to look at what's going on with this patient, look at what's around the patient that may be causing the seizure. Uh, here's another one that a lot of times, you know, people might get, think that could, they can relate this to their childhood. Like I'm sure somebody's been sick when they were little and their parents wrapped them up in a bunch of blankets and it's like, oh, you're going to sweat it out. You're going to sweat it out. And in all actuality, what you're doing is the body's heating up and you're wrapping all these blankets around this you know child and you're heating them up more uh so you could make that fever you know go higher and so when you come up on scene you look you have a little baby who's having seizure activity and you know mom or dad has them wrapped in a bunch of blankets well you guys might need to know okay well we need to take some of these clothes off. we need to take these blankets off we need to start cooling this child down because that could be causing that seizure activity all right. Now, the patient may be postictal, so they may, you know, be unconscious still. They may be very lethargic, weak, delayed with their responses a little bit, but because they're coming out of a seizure. Now, if the patient is actively seizing, we're going to move objects away from them in order to protect the patient. Okay. Maybe apply a pillow, something behind the head, so they're not hitting their head against the ground. Maybe guide some of their movements so they're not hitting something with an extremity that's convulsing. The last thing we want to do, though, is to pin a seizure patient down. So if we come up on scene and people are holding the patient down, uh, we're going to have them release the patient because we never want to pin down or hold down a seizure patient. Okay, and then seizure activity may precede cardiac arrest. Again, just be diligent with assessing the patient and keep a close eye on your vital signs. All right, so protect a seizing patient from injury, so we're moving objects away. All right, now with your primary assessment, assess the airway. With this, uh, it is common for them to bite their tongue, okay? So you can have some bleeding in the airway. Anatomically impossible, though, to swallow their tongue. All right, so... Uh, the patient's not going to swallow their tongue. You have no risk of that, but I'm more concerned about them clenching and biting their tongue and they'll be bleeding. So make sure you have suction ready. Assess breathing and oxygenation. These patients may be hypoxic, so applying some kind of oxygen to them to get their O2 levels up. Now assess circulation, of course, skin signs, color moisture temperature, assess those peripheral pulses, uh, make sure they have you know good solid pulses. Uh, and then assess transport priority. So are they a patient that's been seizing for you know 10 minutes? Are they a patient that's been seizing and then going post but not regaining consciousness and then seizing again? All right, now I need to know, so, okay, well, this is a patient where I need advanced life support so they can maybe give some medications to stop this seizure activity. Um, that's kind of outside of my scope as an EMT. Okay, clear the airway of secretions, blood, and vomitus. 
All right, now, with transport priority circumstances. Now, high priority patients are gonna be patients that remain unresponsive, have AVC compromise, have status epilepticus, any history of pregnancy, diabetes, or like injury, so the secondary type seizure with pregnancy. Okay, we are concerned about um, these patients now the patient's hypoxic then the baby becoming hypoxic and now we have two patients instead of one seizures that occur in water okay that is a concern for us because we're worried about aspiration so the patient may have aspirated in fluid while that seizure occurred all right so now we're worried about that patient not only coming out of the seizure but now having an issue with gas exchange because they have fluid in their lungs. Okay, evidence of head trauma leading to the seizure, no history of epilepsy or other seizure disorder, i.e. we're thinking there is a secondary cause to this seizure. Okay, and then the seizure is a result of drug or alcohol withdrawal. Now, alcohol withdrawal is very dangerous. Alcohol withdrawal is, is lethal, like no joke in the hospital. Like I'm, a, I'm an ER nurse, like I have gotten medical orders for Budweiser for a patient. Like my first time I saw it, I was like, this has to be, this has to be wrong. <laughs> you know, I look and sure enough, we are bringing a patient, a, a Budweiser, uh for you know at like for a 5 p.m medicine and, and understand that we just don't want this patient to go into a level of withdrawal that is so serious that they are risking losing their life it's like kind of like a risk versus reward thing all right giving this person a beer so they don't die of severe withdrawal you know it's like you gotta kind of weigh it out uh, now, you're not going to necessarily do that as an EMT on an ambulance, but it is interesting uh, to, to see, you know, and it just goes to show how, you know, lethal withdrawal can be that we're giving them, you know, beer you know, as a medicine in the hospital. Uh, so it is just something to, uh, to be aware about there. Withdrawal is lethal. Never underestimate withdrawal. All right, secondary assessment. So we are going to do a good thorough assessment on this patient uh, to again try to find a secondary cause for the seizure. Okay, look for signs of trauma. Okay, doing a good thorough medical assessment, uh, secondary assessment, you could look for things like medical alert tags. All right, yeah, this patient may not have epilepsy, but they may have a medical alert tag for diabetes and their sugars are out of whack, and that's causing the seizure activity. Well, we're finding this by doing a good thorough assessment. Okay, so make sure you're doing a good assessment on the patient. Uh, make sure you're doing a good neuro assessment. Now, we talked about stroke already, so you guys are still going to assess for, you know, your you know, Cincinnati Pre-Hospital stroke scale, facial droop, arm drift speech all right those are all things that you are going to be assessing in these patients it's a good neurological assessment okay assess your vital signs apply oxygen as clinically indicated remember we're trying to keep svo2 above 94. assess your, assess your glucose levels and now consider alfs as emts we have there's a limit to what we can do we have very basic airways we have limited medications okay paramedics they can give medications that can stop seizure activity all right especially if the patient's status epilepticus they can give medications to to bring them out or to stop that seizure from occurring now obtain a history now that is also we want to find out medications that they're taking uh, a lot of patients who have history of seizures may take a medication that they they grow out of and then they need to transition from one medication to another medication. And they normally, they don't stop those medicines cold turkey. So what they'll do is if a patient is on a medication, they're gonna transition them to another medication. They'll dial back on medication A while then adding in medication B, all right? Now you can have people though who don't like the effects of, uh, of a medicine. I had a patient, you know, over over the weekend where it was they just they didn't like the effects of the medicine so they stopped taking it okay and they, of course they were brought back to the er for seizures i have patients who can't afford the medicine so they stopped taking it 
And so uh, understand that if we can find out what medications they're supposed to be taking, are they taking them like they're supposed to, uh, those are all things that you're going to want to look at. Okay, look for medications like Keppra, Ativan, Depakote. Okay, those are all seizure medicines. Um, there are a lot more out there. Your book has a table that lists them. Uh, but look for those in the patients, you know, like if they have like a lot of patients will have a little notebook or a piece of paper with all their meds written on them. Uh, look for that stuff. And then like when you're getting that history, are you taking your medications like you're supposed to? <clears throat> All right, so thorough history for the hospital staff. Okay, we want to know, you know, when the seizure started, how long did the seizure last, and what did the seizure look like? All right, was it a full grand mal type seizure? Was it a absent seizure? Was it a, you know, a simple partial seizure where they just had jerking in one arm? Okay, where they just had sensory issue in one arm? Was it a complex partial seizure where the patient was kind of like, like they're rolling marbles in their hands and smacking their lips? You know, like what did that seizure look like? All right. So signs and symptoms kind of hitting on this again. Uh, know what an aura is. Know your different stages. All right. So whether they tasted pennies, they were seeing spots on their eyes, whatever it is, that unusual odor that they were smelling, uh, loss of consciousness. Convulsions, uh, biting of the tongue, remember, common, excessive uh, saliva production, so be ready for suction, okay, to manage that airway. All right, now with seizure activity, you can see uh, urinary and bowel incontinence, so they can urinate on themselves, they can defecate, all right, uh, not so much something you see with a syncopal episode, all right, so if you come up on a patient, and they've, they've urinated on themselves and they're assessing them and they're just not doing anything on the ground. They're just laying there kind of you know, unconscious. Uh, if they've urinated, odds are it's something more significant than just a, a stinking pull episode where they fainted. All right. Maybe uh, hyperventilating. They may be tachycardic. Okay. Also, post confusion uh, can occur where they don't understand what's going on around them. They may not be fully oriented, uh, but give them time. Okay, Give the patient time. Make sure you're talking to them in that post phase uh, and help reorient them to you know, person, place, time, and surroundings or event. All right. Protect the patient from injury. Going to be our emergency medical care. Now, with patients that are postictal, we're going to put them in a left lateral recumbent position to protect that airway. Uh, they're postictal unconscious. We lay them supine, wrist, the tongue, kind of relaxing and occluding the airway, all right, causing snoring respirations. Now, if the uh, seizure was brought on by trauma, we do need to consider the need for spine motion restriction. Now, with maintaining the airway, uh, with these patients, we're going to lean more to towards a nasal pharyngeal airway versus an oral pharyngeal airway. The reason for that is if they go into a seizure again, the chances of them clenching down, very likely. And with seizure, there was a thought of like, oh, they're seizing, put something in their mouth. It's like, no, that's the last thing you want to do is put anything in their mouth. So with a nasal pharyngeal airway, you'll bypass the teeth. Uh, you'll still get the tongue out of the way with that airway adjunct. Uh, but if we do an OPA and they bite down, one, they risk breaking teeth. Two, they risk breaking our OPA. So we try to stay away from OPAs in patients who are, uh, who are seizing. Now, section as clinically indicated, positive pressure ventilation for patients that are breathing inadequately. Maintain your SBO2 greater than 94% and then transport your patient to the receiving facility. All right, now with these patients, be prepared to manage additional seizures. Okay, be prepared to manage additional seizures. Um, understand that we're just going to protect that patient from trauma to extremities. Uh, we're going to try to keep the airway clear as much as we can. All right, now with pre hospital medications uh, to stop seizures. Um, a lot of times it's going to be a benzodiazepine of some type, okay? 
Uh, it all depends on what your agencies use. Uh, in the hospital, we use uh, Kepra and we use Ativan a lot of times for seizures. Uh, Pre-hospital might be more along the lines of Ativan or Versed. So uh, benzodiazepines are going to be your very common medications that you use to stop seizure activity uh, in a pre-hospital setting. All right, this breaks down your uh, emergency care protocol, and it's the same thing we've talked about: protected airway, NPAs versus you know OPAs. We're going to lead more towards that NPA. All right. We are concerned about seizures lasting longer than five minutes when we get in that status epilepticus due to risk of brain cell damage. All right. Uh, now, with those status epilepticus patients, we definitely want ALS coming. All right. Suction as needed. Now, positive pressure ventilations as clinically indicated. So, if we have a patient that's breathing inadequately, uh, we are going to provide, you know, Rescue breaths, of course, they're going to have a pulse, but one breath every five to six seconds for an adult, one breath every three to five for infants and children, okay, for patients that are breathing inadequately with a pulse, all right, to promote good oxygenation. Now, if breathing is adequate, administer oxygen to keep SpO2 greater than 94%. Patient goes in a lateral recumbent position, okay, paramedics should be called. Uh, especially for repeated seizures or seizures lasting longer than five minutes to give medications to stop the seizure. All right, transport the patient and reassess that patient every five minutes. All right, now with syncope, all right, a syncopal episode is, is fainting. All right, you have a sudden temporary loss of consciousness. All right, oftentimes this is caused from an interruption of cerebral perfusion. Okay, we see this a lot with patients who, you know, you can see this patients who change positions too quickly. If anybody's ever gone from a sitting position, after you've been sitting for a long time, you stood up real fast and you've gotten that head rush. Guess what? You came close to a syncopal episode, but your body through baroreceptors and autonomic function was able to quickly increase your pressure to perfuse your brain. All right, now, as we get older, those responses become slower and we do run the risk of passing out. Okay, that's why one thing we do is we tell people who are like on blood pressure medicines or patients who are older, change positions slowly. Okay, change positions slowly so that way you, you reduce your risk of having a fainting episode. Often you can see it due to increase in parasympathetic influence. Uh, something you don't think of is bearing down. Okay, a, a big parasympathetic stimulator, or how to simulate the uh, the vagus nerve, is a, your cranial nerve uh, bearing down. So patients who are you know maybe backed up and they're straining, bearing down heavy on the toilet, could actually cause themselves to pass out uh, due to parasympathetic stimulation. Okay, Ran a number of calls of patients who have you know passed out between their toilet and their bathtub because they were bearing down and they lost consciousness. And now, oftentimes, too, bystanders may mistake a syncopal episode for a seizure, okay? Because you do get that, you know, some rigidity. I've had a patient, you know, in the hospital that either got up, they changed positions uh, quickly, and they all of a sudden stiffened up, and then kind of went back, and they had you know, snoring, and I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> You know, what's happening is just a quick change of position. They decrease cerebral blood flow and they got stiff. Uh, some people could see that and mistake that for a seizure. All right. So with some of the differentiation between seizures and syncope. Now, with syncope, uh, normally we see this with the patient changing positions and they're in a standing or upright position, whereas seizures can happen in any position. Now, syncope, am I complaining of lightheaded, dizzy prior to the episode? Now, with seizures, they have this aura, so they could have, like, the taste, smell, spots on their eyes, whatever it might be. All right. Syncope, sudden loss of consciousness that immediately returns when supine or prone. In a sense, they're in a position that promotes, you know, perfusion to the brain. The body's not having to work as hard to pump blood up if they're laying flat. All right. Now, a seizure, sudden loss of consciousness that persists and then has a gradual return to consciousness. 
Syncope might have some muscle twitching, all right, or a seizure, convulsion muscle activity, or convulsive muscle activity, or repetitive movements during unconsciousness. Syncope, skin is usually cool, moist, and pale. With seizure, skin may be warm and sweaty. Another thing too, syncope, uh, you're, you're not going to see uh, you know, urinary incontinence with that. So there is some control still of that internal sphincter uh, for autonomic function. Whereas with seizures, that's where we really start to see loss of uh, internal sphincter control. Uh, internal sphincters are more autonomic, where external sphincters are you know, more voluntary. So uh, understand the syncopal episodes, we shouldn't really see urinary or bowel incontinence with that. All right, now, with these patients, conduct a primary and secondary assessment and keep the patient supine. Keep the patient supine. Uh, you know, outside of me being an ER nurse, I'm also a combat medic. Uh, and I see syncopal episodes a lot, believe it or not, during like formation. So people standing up, locking their knees, reducing blood flow, uh, and then they lose consciousness. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we're military, so it's like you want to get that person out of the formation. Um, I've had somebody go, they've lost consciousness, they sit them up, and then as soon as they sit them up, they get all lightheaded again, and then they vomit, and then they go back unconscious. Why is that weird? quick change of positions, uh, and that person's already having issues getting good cerebral perfusion, so we want to keep those patients flat, all right? Now, consider serious underlying causes and encourage transport. Now, it could be, you know, dehydration. Dehydration can be a, a significant finding in these patients. Geriatric patients, dehydration, you're assessing them, they're all their oral mucosa is all dry. Uh, that could be a, a really serious issue because not only it's, do they have lack of fluids, but you can see electrolyte abnormalities that can cause issues with the heart. Okay, so it's really important to encourage these patients to get transported and be evaluated at the facility, at the hospital. Okay, assess your patient for any signs of trauma. All right, now with this uh seizures result from abnormal electrical impulses in the brain understand it's just an electrical firestorm okay neurons are firing off it's not controlled all right seizures can affect one or both hemispheres generalized seizures affect both hemispheres therefore there is a loss of consciousness all right whereas partial seizures only affect one hemisphere so the patient does remain conscious all right Status epilepticus is a life-threatening emergency, okay, seizure lasting longer than 30 minutes, all right, or recurrent seizures, okay, so patient has a seizure, maybe it lasts four minutes, they go post-tictal, but they do not recover, they don't wake up, and then they go into another seizure, all right, we can lump this into the status epilepticus definition. All right, now, with syncope, this results from a temporary interruption in brain perfusion, i.e. changing positions too quickly. All right, dehydrate. Okay, syncope may be benign, okay, but can have serious underlying causes, all right, which we talked about. So just be aware when assessing these patients. A lot of times they may not want to go to the hospital, but encourage them to be evaluated. Okay, and that concludes this period of instruction. Thank you for your time.